Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Tomorrow is Halloween, October 31st, 2020. But today is October 30th, which is Halloween Eve. And I'm going to be reviewing two films on two days just to end this particular month. Yeah, because I've been reviewing so far 10 movies, or I guess I can make it 11 if it counts to the movie Crawl, which I reviewed in late September, uh, going for the particular horror month of October. Um, so I'm going to end with just two movies, and one movie I'm going to review today is Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is from legendary filmmaker Francis Ford Coppola, who gave us such masterpieces as the Godfather films, The Conversation, Apocalypse Now, The Outsiders, Biggest Who Got Mary, among many others that he's done. And this was his first take on doing a gothic horror tale that's based on the 17th century novel by Bram Stoker. A story about how a Transylvanian young prince who falls in love with a beautiful princess uh, during the war, but he eventually lost his love and hoping that someday he'll be able to transform into you know, Count Dracula and he'll be able to have the power to become from old to young and he'll be able to fall in love with a young woman who may might as well be the reincarnation of his true love. And that's how the story goes. And this is the 2007 uh, Blu-ray release, which is the collector's edition. And it has this nice uh, cover art um, that was actually done by uh, Eco. And yeah, you can see uh, Gary Oldman just covering his face. You know, he's all looking as older and wiser than ever. I am Dracula. And then you can see, uh, if you can see up close here, that's supposed to be his um, suit and armor. Yeah, it's, that's like a wolf in some ways. Um, yes, and it does contain features, as you can see and has an assemble cast to join. Um, Gary Oldman plays the part of Count Dracula. He's joined in by Keanu Reeves, Renata Ryder, Anthony Hopkins, uh, as well as uh, Tom Waits, uh, Sadi Frost, um, Richard E. Grant, uh, Carrie Elves, and Billy Campbell. What a great cast. <laughs> oh, and by the way, we did have the 4K remaster Blu-ray that came out in 2015, and it follows the 4K Ultra HD release in 2017, which would be closer to be as accurate as possible um, after the previous release that I have. And hopefully I will pick that up someday if I get a chance. I just hope my local Best Buy or any other store might be able to carry it. And they still have it, I'll, I'll pick it up, no matter what the cost. I don't have a 4K player, but I hope I can get one someday. I mean, I know Black Friday is going to be such a, a big hazard, though, I mean, after this coronavirus. And I hope this, this whole thing will be over by then. Let's pray. Now, this was supposed to be his more accurate story uh, for the whole 17th century uh, Gothic mythology of Dracula, because I know there have been several versions of it, and I mean several film adaptations, uh, ranging from the Universal uh, movie, a uh, monster movie, ranging from the Universal monsters of um, Bela Lugosi's uh, Dracula, yeah, who's a Hungarian actor, all the way through the, the Hammer films uh, with Christopher Lee portraying the role. There was even the, um, the one with Frank Langella portraying the role in the, the John Badham film adaptation. 
And there have been like sub orders too, even ones that had started to make a lot of parodies and everything like that. Um, but the one thing about this version though was that this is closer to the novel as simply as he wanted it to be. And it also blemished with tons of visual effects that were not done digitally, surprisingly enough. Not done by a computer. It was actually done by old school filmmaking. You know, like he brought in like an old school camera that dates back to the silent film era and also brought in some matte paintings that they had created and they use a lot of um, you know real um, rats and other stuff too like animals and, or I, I think they might have used some animatronics too but most likely real animals and also a lot of great makeup effects that they created to make them look exactly like how the characters really go even if they've been bitten so they become like vampires and all and also the fact that it was nominated for four Academy Awards it won free for best costume design best sound editing and best makeup and they did an incredible job with that too with the costumes making it look as 17th century as it should be um, for the cast alone and and the direction and the way they built all these sets and all that it just they made this particular masterpiece come to life rightly so uh, anyway uh, now I'm gonna go back to the blu-ray that I picked up because I got it at Ralph's uh, the supermarket in Southern California for $9.99 it's an early release and the transfer on this particular um, disc is almost closer to be the accurate press the accurate presentation on how it came out in theaters you know the 35 millimeter film grain as it should be um, although there's a bit of color grading that really went into it like it went a, a bit darker at times it still has the flesh tones and all that in there um, but it's supposed to almost look exactly like how it came out in theaters um, which I did saw it uh, back when I was only seven years old I went to see it with my cousin Opa along with my uncle Louie and my brother Jason we saw that uh, the same theater where we went to see uh, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey uh, along with Total Recall and other films but we saw it uh, at the Pacific Roxy Theater in Glen Mill, California and I remember when I went to see it though there was like a huge line you know we were all lined up just to get to our seats and get to pay a um, small amount of money though it was like five dollars when we went to see it. Yeah, it was pretty cheap. Um, everyone was excited to see this um, on this particular night because yeah, people couldn't stop talking about it. Everyone was excited mostly because Coppola was, was back on the game you know, after, after having some trouble you know, trying to find like a successful hit and hoping his continuation after his success with The Godfather Part 3 despite of its you know, criticism of how the story goes or how it doesn't match the first two films and the fact that yes uh, the criticism on uh, Coppola's daughter Sophia who would soon become a director but she's also a fashion designer herself um, very beautiful but I know she's no actor yeah actress um, but therefore that kind of also led to criticism on Keanu Reeves because of his uh, English accent that he was given that I, I can I could definitely understand what they're saying too because I I have some issues myself too when I saw the movie like I felt like maybe they could have had Johnny Depp to play the part because in fact he would have been excellent in that role of of Jonathan Harker because when he does his English accent, he does it exactly what the way people speak. And if they casted him, I mean, it would save the film. But, I mean, therefore, I can live with Keanu Reeves. And I love, I always love Keanu Reeves. Ever since, of course, Bill and Ted films, among other stuff that he's done. And I guess at times I almost do think of him as Ted. <laughs> Like, I was almost ready for someone to say, Shut up, Ted! <laughs> but, 
whatever. But I, I always loved Renault Ryder ever since um, movies like Beetlejuice, uh, Headers, and all. And I know she was going to be originally cast to play um, uh, Michael Folioni's daughter. And sadly, I, I wish she had played the role too, but because she got ill, or maybe some situations going around with her and and Depp, because you know they were at the time you know, a couple for a while. Um, yeah, for a while. And also because the fact that she had to do a movie uh, with Cher, and that's what led to this uh, this true uh, story. I th I think maybe that was the case. So finally, uh, Coppola actually had a chance to have uh, Renata Ryder be cast, uh, mostly from the script that he that he had from uh, writer James uh, James B. Hartz. And yeah, he wrote the screenplay, you know, going for the elements of of all the old school um, Dracula adaptations here, and he wants to blend it in, try to be exactly particularly right, um, join in with the music and. That's incredibly uh, gothic right there, more frightening than ever. And the cinematography looks exquisite, all on screen. Um, some incredible editing. All three uh, people actually have done it together, and then they had to do everything to make it all shine. And, and of course, I mean, it was a big hit. Um, out of its 40 million budget, uh, it made, surprisingly enough, uh, 215.8 million dollars. Big surprise. And it actually got positive reviews from critics. Well, some got mixed reactions on how they felt, but at the same time, they did enjoy it. Anyway, let's get to the review. It stars Gary Oldman, uh, a great uh, British actor. There's been a lot of great films like Sid and Nancy, yeah, the Batman movies, uh, yeah, the one that Christopher Nolan directed, yeah, the Dark Knight trilogy. Um, he's in the films like uh, State of Grace. Uh, he was in Criminal Law, uh, among others. Excellent actor. Uh, Keanu Reeves, of course, from the Bill and Ted movies, Speed, the original Point Break. Um, the John Wick films now, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Matrix films, I mean, Johnny Mnemonic, among others, yeah. I always loved that actor. Renata Ryder, of course, Beetlejuice, Headers, uh, Welcome Home, Roxy Carmichael, uh, Stranger Things, the TV show, yeah. Anthony Hopkins, who just, uh, after this, uh, or perhaps the other film that he did, which is Howard's End, he just won the Oscar for his performance as Hannibal Lecter himself, the cannibalistic uh, serial killer for Signs of the Lambs. Yeah. But he also has done a lot of excellent work in his career. Um, brilliant actor. Richard E. Grant. Um, who I know he's been in other films like How to Get Ahead in Advertising and he's in the movie uh, Warlock he was also did some voice acting for the film he was a villain in the movie uh, Tim Burton's Corpse Bride and and he's done a lot of great work uh, Carrie Elves who or Elwes yeah Carrie Elwes uh, from as you already know uh, The Princess Bride uh, among many others he's done in his career. Uh, Billy Campbell, who for those who don't know, he was in the movie The Rocketeer. Uh, Sade Frost, uh, this was her first film. Uh, Tom Waits, a uh, musician, singer, songwriter. Uh, Monica Bellucci, yes, uh, French, she's a uh, Yes, she's a model, but she's became an actress with other films that she's done in, this, in her career, such as Shoot 'em Up. She was also in the movie uh, The Matrix Reloaded, which also had Keanu Reeves. <laughs> what do you know? 
Michelle Buko, Karina Kendrick, and Jay Robinson. It's, um, of course, produced not only by Coppola, it's also produced by Fred Fuchs, not Fox, Fred Fox, like <laughs> ABGN, you know, James Rolf has said. Fred Fox? Fred Fox? <laughs> I know, because he was playing the video game. Yeah, there was a video game based on that, too, uh, that came out uh, from Sony. Um, anyway, <laughs> and Charles uh, Mulvihill, um, it's written, of course, by James V. Hartz, which is based on the novel by Bram Stoker, yeah, Dracula, and it's directed by Francis R. Coppola. The movie began set in 1462. We meet the Transylvanian prince named Vod Dracula, who's played by Gary Oldman, who returns from a victory against the Turks. Yeah, there was a war battle going around. And also to find his wife, Elisabetta, who's played by Renata Ryder, who actually committed suicide after his enemies reported his death. But the priest tells him that his wife's soul is damned to hell for committing suicide. Feeling very enraged, Dracula desecrated the chapel and renounced God by declaring that he will rise from the grave to avenge Elisabetta with all the powers of darkness. He then stabs the chapel's stone cross with his sword and he drinks the blood as it pours uh, directly straight into the, the Holy Grail cup. And yes, it starts pouring all the way from the the particular statuette of the, the child almost looked like she, she was he was actually bleeding through her through that per through the child's eyes and tears and of course blood coming from the candle too and blood starts to pour all the way around and starts to hit directly into the corpse of Elisabetta. Yeah. If you saw the deleted scenes, I mean all of that starts to start to flood all the way around her entire body and I would imagine how she felt when she was drenched in blood. A fountain of it too. <laughs> then we lead to 1897 where we meet a solitaire named Jonathan Harker who's played by Keanu Reeves who takes the Transylvanian Count Dracula also played by Oldman as a client from his colleague uh, Renafield, who's played by Tom Waits, who has actually gone insane. Yeah, I went straight to the mental institution. So therefore, Jonathan travels to Transylvania to arrange the real estate equations in London for Dracula. And then Jonathan meets Dracula, who discovers a picture of his fiancée, you know, Minya Mary, also played by writer and believes that she might be the reincarnation of Elisabetta. So then, yeah, because when you saw the introduction too of Dracula, I, I love how he just holds in the lamp. I mean, just before um, he was about to say it, because Jonathan just said, Count Dracula, and he, he was about to say, yes, I am Dracula. Yeah, with the with this white hair, white uh, pale face, and he and he's drenched in this particular long uh, red cape, you know, and this gown and all. Definitely look exactly what we saw. Once uh, Jonathan enters um, his castle, you begin to see uh, the reflections, or perhaps. At this rate, you get to see the shadow of his the Dracula silhouette starts to change. But yes, um, there is a reflection on the mirror when when Jonathan was like shaving, and he accidentally cut himself on his neck. Where um, you don't really see um, Dracula's uh, face through the mirror. It, it it seems more invisible. I'm like, wow. Um, anyway, 
So, Dracula leaves Jonathan to be fed upon by his uh, free brides, and all which are played by Monica Bellucci, Michelle Buku, and Farina Kendrick. Yeah. And, um, therefore, yes, I mean, already, you know, they're about to feed his particular flesh of blood and while he's about to sail to England with a box of Transylvanian soil take it upon the, the Carfax Abbey and his arrival was foretold by the Ravens of Renfield which of course now an inmate with Dr. Jack uh, Sewell's insane asylum Okay, I'm just looking at my um, meanwhile in London, Dracula emerged as a wolf-like creature. Yeah, he can actually transform to like several uh, creatures or any other kind that he loves to choose. But not only that, but he gets to transform into his younger self. Like, any way he wants it, under his command. Um, once he was awakened uh, through the coffin. Yeah, which awakens exactly like how you saw it in all the the classic uh, Dracula tales, you know, or any other mythology here, like, you always see Dracula just waking up, you know, through the coffins, and he moves all the way up like that. Just, wow. Okay. Anyway. At this point on, there was a fierce thunderstorm that was happening, uh, with both, um, Mina and her sister uh, Lucy uh, was Nera, who was played by Sadi Frost. Yeah, she's the redhead who was um, destined to become married to um, her uh, fiance, and that's where they're staying while Jonathan's at Transylvania. Lucy's uh, deteriorating health, however, starts to change after she went through a trance and was bitten by the, the wolfman creature that suddenly she starts to become more weaker than ever and her behavior starts to change even more uh, joined by her uh, former suitors uh, Quincy Morris and Dr. Seward along with her fiance Arthur Homeworld all played by Billy Campbell Richard E. Grant and Carrie Elves. But that's how they hired uh, Dr. Abraham Van Helsing, who was played by Anthony Hopkins, who recognized Lucy as the victim of the vampire, which happens to be Dracula, who already had been appearing as young and handsome during the daylights. And that's where, of course, he went on to meet uh, Minya, just hanging around, charming her and be able to explain about how he, he lost his love, uh, Elisabetta, and how she resembles her very well, that they soon tend to fall in love too, by actually having him um, biting her neck. But she was kind of afraid too. And also the wolf actually came, you know, the white wolf, um, who was starting to frighten all the locusts around in London uh, after they were watching a show and then um, he actually had Minya pet this particular wolf hoping that this wolf won't attack her and you know they soon you know, had a drink you know, making conversations and all and they fell in love. Things seemed to get much worse was when Lucy suddenly uh, continues to act very strangely. She was ready to bite, bite uh, Quincy, but of course they had to spread all the garlic and everything so that way, you know, she'll be like knock um, unconscious here and hopefully that the spell will go away as soon as possible, but it only gets worse when when Dracula came uh, using the, the wolf to control and be able to attack Lucy 
and, it's, and that's where all the blood starts to shoot up. I also forgot to mention that uh, there was like a ship sail uh, heading away with all the deliveries of packages of, of several uh, zoo creatures around, including him, and it just appears where then some of the, um, the ship crew actually got attacked by them and blood starts to shoot around and everything. So yes, uh, Lucy was, well, supposedly dead, but it turns out she was actually undead. So at that point on, Ben Helsing, Homeward, Sewell, and Morris decided to kill the undead Lucy as she just came and just grabbed a child and was ready to attack Arthur. And then suddenly, well, that's where uh, Helsing brought in the cross and it was ready to go back straight into the coffin. And then next thing you know, and this is where they actually take the stake and stab it directly into her heart and then afterwards cut her head off. And it rolled completely. And that's how they explained it to uh, during the, you know, a feast, you know, with Minya, Jonathan, but, and Helsing, of course, just telling about the story about what happened to Lucy. So after Jonathan and Minya have returned to London, um, Jonathan and Ben Helsing led to the others at Carfax Abbey, where they had to destroy all the boxes of soil that Count Dracula has sent. While Dracula enters the asylum, where he kills uh, Renfield for warning Minya about his presence, that's where we see this uh, this green glow of um, of dust started to appear, and it was going straight directly into Minya, where she had to stay into the bedroom, trying to be safe. And that's how Dracula appears, and and his younger self, hoping they will be able to fall in love one last time until he wants up being transformed into a bat yeah. and that's where the game just came back and ready to stop him and yeah, he also speaks too and then he turns into a bunch of rats and he escapes as soon as possible as we already know Minya has been uh, bitten by Dracula now she's under the spell, and now they're going to try to find a way to stop them, but they have to get into the packages to, to go after Dracula, who, who's the one who's controlling all of this. And that's what led to this, uh, when they went all the way um, through the mountains, they're about to get, attack all the other um, villagers around who are about to send the, the package. Um, killing them one by one, and then next they're about to destroy that package before you know, Dracula appears, and then Jonathan actually uh, took out the knife and just cuts his neck. Um, however, Quincy uh, got stabbed and was killed um, you know, after that, and therefore. It was all alone for both um, Minya and and Dracula all together to finally get their one final shot where now since he's been stabbed in the heart you know, through the sword just one last time to actually give um, his, his eternal love a kiss and then and finally stabs him all the way into his body and then cut his head off. And that's how we saw at the end, like a, uh, through the ceiling, we see like a painting of both Dracula and Elisabetta all together now in heaven instead of hell. <laughs> it's a very uh, wonderful uh, gothic tale. And I would say Coppola did an excellent job um, adapting it exactly the way he wanted it to be. Uh, the performances, particularly Gary Oldman, 
uh, actually really nailed his incredible performance as Dracula. I mean, he's almost as closer to the Dracula we know from, you know, Bill Lugosi, as well as Christopher Lee. And the way he did it is exactly what I expected. And he nailed it perfectly. I mean, this is the kind of role that he would have earned an Oscar for, if you ask me. And I, I wish he had won at the time, but sadly he never had a chance. And Renata Ryder was incredibly beautiful playing both Minya and Elisabetta. I mean, given her uh, English accent, I thought she really uh, nailed it perfectly, too. Some people may have its issues with her, but not me. Uh, Keanu Reeves was fine as Jonathan Harker, who was supposed to be the, the fiancé for Mina. But, for what it is, I mean, he did what the best he could. It, hey, I've seen worse when it comes to good actors. You know, trying to portray the role that could have been exquisite, but it's not. And I understand. I mean, it's like now we're going for this Sofia Coppola thing over again. But no matter what, I do enjoy both of them just wasn't one of his best performances or their best performance perhaps. Avi Hopkins uh, is truly awesome as Abraham Van Helsing who's also the narrator of the film too and the priest yeah that, that was another role he did I mean I, I love how even at the end when he actually cut off the the three brides his heads off and dumped it all the way down into uh, the mountains, and he says, Draco! Draco! I, I love that. And definitely the hero right there. <laughs> um, as for the other cast, uh, Richard e. Grant um, was great, so was Carrie Elves and Billy Campbell. Saudi Frost, on the other hand, is very sexy, incredibly beautiful. Um, even when she was now being cast as a vampire under the spell of Dracula, I mean, she's even more sexier. And she's a very underrated actress, too. You know? She really nailed that, too. And, and I know it's sad that she died. Uh, Tom Reitz was great, also. Uh, this is pretty interesting for a musician to actually play an actual role. Because I know he went on to do uh, Mystery Man later on, too. Uh, but he was great. Um, and it was also nice to see uh, Monica Bellucci in a very earlier role as, as one of the Dracula's brides. And yeah, she's very incredibly attractive and sexy, too. I mean, you do get to see some gratuitous nudity in the film as opposed to the other ones. Yeah, like the boobs and all. You, you can do see a lot of that for Sadie Frost too. But um, the violence in the movie was incredibly gory at times. You know, with blood shooting around and everything. And I love the visual effects that he, that Coppola and his team has done. I mean, he also joins in with his uh, son, who's the second unit. Uh, director and the visual effects artist who of course uh, even before computers which I know this was at the era where computers is becoming the new generation for CGI and visual f and digital effects this one was done exactly the way practical effects were meant to be because he wanted to go back to old school filmmaking and all you know trying to make this particular period look exactly as natural um, innovative and exquisite. Once again, I have to say that, but that's cool. And um, it just feels like this is exactly the period we really needed. And I love the, the shots of those matte paintings that they had to do to make it look exactly cool. They even used a, a projection uh, for the train sequences when Jonathan was like riding around. Uh, while he was writing in his journal, uh, 
you can tell that they did use some miniatures but you can also tell that this is not done on a green screen it was actually done uh, for the projection so they had to film the landscapes of the background and then you can see like the eyes of Dracula uh, through the sunrise or perhaps sunset particularly it's supposed to be sunset and you can see a natural color red blemishing in um, there's like tons of that in the movie and I, I like the, the the other close up transitions that they put into like they show the close up of their eyes between uh, Minya and and Dracula while it shows like a close up of, of them drinking like Serenade and you can see all these close ups of, of all the bubbles and, oh wow I can't. I couldn't believe they did all these uh, amazing uh, shots here, and some other shots too, where they started to find out all the blood cells too. That looks exactly almost like the actual blood cells we know. You know, when we're taking, uh, you know, science. You know, like when we test out the blood, we just begin to see how the blood cells flow. You know, the red bloods or the white bloods. So, yeah. Wow, I mean, see, why can't we have something like that nowadays? I mean, with practical effects, you can do anything, as opposed to computers. But there's nothing wrong with using computers, though. It's just, I just really miss the days when, you know, when practical effects was, was more charming. I mean, it's a lot of hard work, but you have to do whatever you can to make it as perfect as possible. And how uh, they even created the miniature sets, and how they tr they capture all the other uh, setting here and there, and how they built them from from scratch, and how they created all the costume designs, like the armor and and the suits. I mean, all done exactly the way they wanted it to be, almost closer to like something out of you know Beauty and the Beast in a way. And uh, also the fact that the paintings themselves were trying to become more influenced to all the other uh, artists out there uh, from those sam all these uh, 17, 18, or 19 centuries out there. Um, and they give them a lot of credit for that too. And they also had to brought in a lot of uh, people who was going to take the time and to do so. Uh, but for the rest of the team, I mean, they they just did a lot of um, incredible stuff. Yeah, with in cameras, on sets, yeah, matte paintings, uh, miniature effects, multiple exposures, comp compositing, optical illusions. I mean, once again, they just look innovative as ever before and this was Coppola's choice not to use uh, CGI and that's why it works uh, yeah the costume design of course uh, was done by Iko Ashioka and yeah she won for that and and the rest of the people who, who did all this also has a wonderful score that's done by what well, Jack uh, Carlar. I'm not so sure if I said it right, but whatever. Uh, but it did have a song by Annie Lennox uh, from if Affirmix. Uh, I don't know if I said that that band's name's right. Uh, your Affirmix, I think, <sighs> or whatever. Um, it, which was a song called simply "Love Song for a Vampire," and I remember that song too. Uh, that was at the end credits. Um, yeah, and, and they also had a lot of merchandise when it came out, too. Uh, they had a novelization, and they got a lot of... Uh, I, I did mention about the video games uh, that they were getting. They also had a pinball game, a board game. Um, they had uh, a lot of action figures that they did, and they even provided the art by 
interestingly enough, Mike Manola, who of course uh, went on to, to has been best known for giving us Hellboy. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Yeah. And of course, it has done a lot of parodies of other movies too. I mean, I remember they did a parody of that on The Simpsons, which is uh, the episode called Treehouse of Horror. Four. Yeah, which was actually called Bart Simpson's Dracula. Yeah, which had uh, Mr. Burns uh, portraying as Dracula. That's exactly like uh, Gary Oldman played. Uh, in Living Color did that too. <laughs> uh, with Jim Carrey and um, oh wow e even Stranger Things sort of uh, did a reference to that uh, well a little bit uh, about the dance scene uh, that they were doing where Sean Astin uh, who played uh, Bob Newley uh, Newbie which was the boyfriend of Joyce Breyers I mean when he yeah because I know Renard Ryder <laughs> play the part of Minya and Elizabetta would actually end up sharing the dance together in, in the as a homage but of course seeing that Dracula came out in 1992 I mean this movie the series is supposed to be set in the 80s that was long before that <laughs> okay but it's a very intro but it is a very um, inferential uh, romantic uh, gothic like uh, vampire film that we'll ever have and I gotta say Coppola did an excellent job uh, portraying that I mean even if the film has its flaws I understand but what makes it so popular is what is what made is that this movie will never die and it also shows you that love never dies so anyway that's Bram Stoker's Dracula and I give the film Four and a half stars, uh, mostly because of the issue of Keanu Reeves' performance, but that's okay. And maybe some of the issues of the story, maybe some other things going around. But other than that, though, it's as close as the adaptation we can get. So I still love it. I'm, so anyway, I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later following Halloween. Bye.